So welcome everybody to this webinar about automated colony counting systems, which will cover a systematic approach for the evaluation, um, validation and implementation. And this webinar is held on behalf of Bioforum's Alternative and Rapid Microbial Methods team. And for those of you who are not familiar with Bioforum, I would just like to say a few words about our work. So at Bioforum, we provide a platform for biopharmaceutical companies to collaborate, share and pool knowledge and build solutions together that benefit all companies. Um, Bioforum is organized in separate forums, hence the name Bioforum. And within each forum, we have various work streams. Um, each work stream is led by a dedicated facilitator. For example, I myself, I am leading the ARM work stream, um, uh, which sits in Phil Finish and consists of three teams, one for automated colony counters, one for rapid sterility test systems, and one for biofluorescent particle counters. Each of them work on best practices. And this webinar will present two outputs of the work stream. The first is a general framework for the evaluation, validation, and implementation of alternative and rapid microbiological test methods. And that was published um, in July 2020 on the Bioforum website. The framework is used across all three sub teams and has been applied to automated colony counters. And that paper was published in March this year in the PDA journal. And this is what the main part of this webinar is going to be about. The authors of the um, paper are leading experts in their field. One of the two main authors is Sven Deutschmann from Roche, who will lead the presentation today. But we also have two co-authors with us. So Caroline Dynan from GSK and Chris Knudsen from BMS. And both of them will support the Q&A session. So before we start, just a little bit of housekeeping. As you can see, the webinar is recorded. Uh, and we will send a link to the recording after the webinar. So not immediately, but certainly within the next couple of days. Um, and we will also send a link to the slide deck so you can go through the details uh, in your own time. Um, Sven will present the slides in one go and we will have a Q&A session afterwards. So please put your questions into the chat box as we go along. And also, please, if you haven't done so, but I think everybody has, uh, keep your camera switched off and mute yourself until we start the Q&A session. And then, of course, we can put the cameras back on. Um, so, yeah, and that's it from me. And over to you, Sven. So I'll stop sharing and you can grab the screen. OK, yeah, Margaret, thanks a lot for the kind introduction. Uh, one second. Here I am. Uh, Share my screen and now you should see the slides in the come on in the presenter mode, correct? We do. OK, excellent. Yeah, uh, colleagues, uh, I wish you a wonderful morning or afternoon or whatever, wherever you're located. And, and uh, yeah, as Margaret already indicated, I will guide you through roughly 25 uh, slides uh, describing uh, the process uh, for the evaluation, validation and implementation of automated colony counting systems. Uh, as Margaret already introduced, uh, we generated a framework, docu framework document, which is uh, more or less a generic uh, document. You can see here uh, release date was uh, more or less two years ago and you can, if you're interested in the topic and I would assume you are interested, otherwise you would not attend the, the webinar, then you can download it uh, from the Bioforum homepage. Yeah, the, the framework document describes a nine step approach you can see here. This is the uh, content uh, slide of, of this framework document. Uh, a nine step approach for the uh, evaluation, validation and implementation of, of uh, alternative uh, or rapid micro methods. And today uh, we like uh, to, to guide you through this nine step approach uh, and, and we apply this nine step approach uh, for automated uh, colony counting systems. 
As Margaret already mentioned, uh, for, for further information, please uh, consult this uh, PDA journal publication. As you can see here, it wasn't only uh, Chris, uh, Caroline and me. You can see uh, several peer uh, or colleagues from peer companies uh, were involved in, in the generation of this document. Uh, to some extent, I refer to this uh, publication. So some of the, the tables uh, are only available on, on, uh, in this publication and uh, it would be far too much to, to copy paste it into a slide deck. So please, uh, if you're interested in, in this uh, nine step approach for the evaluation, validation and implementation of automated colony counting systems, please download this document. Okay. what? you can see here is the first step and then maybe a bit uh, explanation uh, how I organized the slides. What you can see here is this more or less uh, a table. Uh, in the first row you can see the step. Here uh, in the next minute I will talk about step one and we called it identify operational and business needs. And this is a generic content of this uh, specific uh, step of the nine step approach. And in the lower part of this table, you can see specifics uh, for automated colony counting systems. And you will see this uh, layout uh, yeah, nine times as I, I will describe the nine steps. So yeah, as I mentioned, first step is the identification of the operational uh, of the operational and business need. Uh, you have some kind of a problem or opportunity statement why uh, you're interested in, in the evaluation, validation, implementation of an alternative and rapid micro methods. It could be reduction of the analytical lead time, automation to, to optimize your work uh, or your lab uh, workflow, whatever. Uh, for automated colony counting systems, uh, we feel that these devices uh, are uh, a good uh, tool to improve uh, the data integrity situation in your lab through automation, direct data capture, uh, access control software, traceability of data, audit trails. Uh, the, the automation uh, allows you to have a complete uh, chain of custody in your lab. So this system, uh, these fully automated systems uh, will allow you uh, to improve the situation in your lab. We feel and uh, I hope I can can yeah, share it with you in, in one of the slides or some of the slides that the automated colony countings are equivalent or better uh, regarding uh, accuracy and precision. Uh, compared to the classical counting uh, of the colonies by one or two analysts. This brings me to, to the next uh, topic as well. Uh, it depends on the criticality of your samples, but um, most uh, peer companies uh, use in the meantime uh, contemporaneous verification. This means a second analyst verifies the colony counts the first analyst uh, yeah, counted. Uh, this is, of course, uh, additional uh, workload, additional headcount requirements, and then you can uh, optimize this situation by a fully automated uh, readout device, such as the automated colony counting systems. Uh, there is the option, at least one system allows you to uh, reduce the incubation time. Uh, this allows you faster results for both negative or passing results. And if you would exceed uh, internal uh, alert action level, or maybe uh, you, you fail your specification, then you can, can react much earlier. Uh, of course, the, the efficiency gains, reduced uh, headcount requirements, uh, can redirect uh, the analyst time from repetitive, repetitive tasks, such as counting of the colonies, uh, to other more beneficial uh, activities. Yeah, and as I already mentioned, uh, some uh, or at least one system allows you to reduce the incubation, incubation time. And this could be a very important aspect for products with limited shelf life. After this uh, yeah, problem or opportunity statement, the next step is uh, you have to define the application. Of course, we all know that we, we have three categories in, in uh, the microbiological arena. Uh, we talk about qualitative assays, quantitative assays, and ID. In our case, uh, automated colony counters are quantitative uh, assays. And in the next steps, you have to define your application area, either environmental monitoring, uh, product testing, IPC, drug substance, drug product, uh, whatever, raw material testing, water testing, and so on. 
what we feel uh, automated colony uh, counters ca uh, can uh, be used very broadly. Uh, you can use it for product testing, regardless whether this is IPC, uh, like truck substance release tests, uh, uh, EM activities, uh, water testing, cleaning validation and monitoring of, of cleaning uh, processes, of course for raw material bio burden testing and release, uh, root cause investigations, but also cross promotion tests. So this is really a, a very uh, good technology which can replace the classical microbial enumeration test for, for various uh, applications. The third step uh, is, is very important as this is the step where you have to describe your specific requirements, the user require user specific requirements, your S. Uh, you must define what, what you are looking for, yeah, such as uh, reduce time to result or time to detection, uh, reduce complexity, uh, as I already um, touched, uh, data integrity si situation, whether uh, to improve this uh, data integrity situation, less operational costs, whatever. Uh, here is a, a list uh, of, of some of the, the topics we felt uh, which uh, are important for the assessment and the selection of uh, this automated colony counter. Uh, data integrity situation should be assessed. The LIMS connectivity, it could be, uh, or you, you could specify whether you need a uni or bidirectional interface between the, the machine and, and your LIMS system. Of course, maturity of the technology is, is very important. The ease of use uh, and the, the extent of use in the industry, level of automation, uh, whether you whether or not you you have to purchase proprietary uh, consumables, media cassettes, whatever. This could uh, be a very important aspect. How many samples can be assessed at the time, and if you are interested in uh, earlier release uh, or a reduced incubation time, uh, you have to assess the so-called time to result. Uh, potential requirements uh, are ex uh, are covered in table one of uh, table one and table two of the publication. Of course, uh, this list is uh, can be expanded, so please uh, add additional company specific requirements to this list. The third part is. Uh, you have to compare options and technologies. More or less, uh, you should generate an overview where you compare the classical testing, microbial enumeration test, uh, colony counting by, by one or two analysts with the URS uh, aspects or parameter I already described. I don't like to repeat everything, data integrity, links, connectivity, and so on and so on. Uh, yeah, we did this exercise uh, as in, in our publication, so please uh, refer to table one and two uh, of the publication. The fifth step, oh yeah, before I go to the fifth step, uh, good point. Uh, I think it's it's time to introduce the, the two devices or technologies uh, we compared in, in our publication. Uh, when we started the drafting process, it was yeah more or less three years ago, two commercially uh, systems uh, were uh, available on the market. Uh, and therefore our exercise comparing traditional counting with the automated uh, colony counters covers two different technologies. Uh, of course, I cannot uh, tell you uh, the, the name of the, the machine or the vendor, but I like to describe the, the readout device and probably most or all of you know which two systems uh, we have, we've, we, uh, we've had in our mind. Uh, the first device uses a high definition camera, camera and a used illumination based counting of colonies. Uh, it includes uh, or uses a robotic system uh, to move the plates from the incubation part uh, of the device uh, to the CCD camera and it uh, generates pictures every 30 minutes. Uh, the computer tracks the pictures and counts the colonies as they appear over the time. Uh, and the use of the high resolution camera allows uh, for visualization of colonies before they are visible to the human eyes. This is very important as uh, it can count colonies when they are very small and sometimes even before they merge. Uh, 
So the, the count, and you will see later in, in our validation activities, accuracy and precision is typically higher if, if you are using uh, uh, automated uh, devices. Uh, the pictures of this system can be retrieved when necessary. The second device has uh, more or less the, the same configuration, but the difference is that they use a, a high definition CCD camera and illumination in conjunction with an intrinsic out of sense based counting of colonies. So this uh, instrument uh, does not uh, only only takes pictures, but it relies on the autofluorescence, which can be generated when certain biological components are excited with uh, blue light at a specific wavelength. In this case, every four hours, the, the plates are moved from the incubator part uh, to the CCT camera part to the readout part. Then the plates are uh, illuminated with flashes of the, the blue light and uh, the fluorescing colonies, micro colonies will be captured with the CCT camera. Uh, more or less, uh, the system uses uh, a similar algorithm. So uh, every four hours, uh, it, it generates individual pictures, and and then these pictures will will use to generate an overlay plot. And and this is what you can see here in the lower part of of this slide. Uh, every four hours, a picture will be generated, and fluorescing events will be captured. In this case, after twelve hours. Uh, so I, I skipped uh, the four and eight hour pictures, but after 12 hours, you can see, I hope you can see, there is a little tiny fluorescing spot. And this spot, very important, at the same place, increases over time after 16, 20, 24, and so on. Uh, it increases not only in, in size, diameter, but also in intensity. And this increase of fluorescence uh, will be used by the algorithm to discriminate between dead, dead particles, which do not grow, where the fluorescence uh, does not increase over time, and growing colonies. Okay, but now back to the next step, the business case development. At that time, uh, it, uh, it's a good time to, to start the business case uh, evaluation. Uh, and, and for this uh, activity, you should uh, evaluate uh, yeah, whether there are risks associated uh, with the technology or whether the technology can fulfill your assumptions. Uh, you should consider costs such as CAPEX, operating costs, uh, filing costs. Uh, you should uh, do a return on investment or payback period uh, calculation. I think this is very important for our finance departments. And please do not underestimate uh, the implementation timeline, the qualification, validation, and filing. In our publication, uh, we provided in uh, the step five assessment some yeah, case studies in more detail. So there is a section uh, which describes the benefit of automation in, in more detail. Uh, a section about uh, the data integrity improvements, and we provide uh, two case studies, so to speak, an accuracy case study and a rapid result case studies. Uh, what can be, uh, or what, what are the benefits if, if the accuracy is higher, and then what are the benefits if you can generate a, a result earlier? Uh, yeah, nevertheless, uh, th this is just an example. Uh, there are probably much more uh, aspects uh, you can uh, evaluate. In addition, uh, we provided some very simple tools uh, to calculate uh, a number which can be used for the decision making. So uh, we have a table uh, or two tables in, in the publication. Uh, table three uh, provides some bu financial business uh, case considerations, and table four is this is a very simple description of the decision making process. And we feel at least four aspects should be assessed uh, during this uh, business case development exercise. Of course, the financial aspects, return of investment and, and uh, payback period. Any efficiency gains uh, are tied more or less to the financial aspect uh, consideration. We feel user or industry feedback, uh, feedback is very important. And of course, uh, if you have, uh, or you should consider or you should evaluate whether your internal user requirement specifications are fulfilled by one or both of the two uh, devices. The next step, uh, 
I think it's, it's it would be beneficial if you would uh, apply this sixth uh, six step. So this is a yeah, feasibility or proof of concept study. Whenever you have uh, multiple technologies uh, which could be used for, for your purposes, uh, then I think it, it's the right time to run some to run some com, uh, comparability studies uh, for one or two uh, or more of the candidates. Uh, I think it's it's very important uh, to do some hands-on work with the machine uh, to assess or confirm, verify vendor claims or data which are either generated by vendors uh, or which are available uh, by by any paper publications. And I think very important, and, and this should be performed in this uh, pre-validation or proof of concept study, you should ass assess whether your the new technology is compatible with your own product. Uh, additional aspects uh, which can be uh, assessed and considered during this uh, feasibility or proof of concept study are, does the method as well as the media type used uh, work for your test metrics? Does the system detect colonies uh, of your in-house microflora? Uh, IT part, is the system and the software compatible with your network and your LIMS system? Uh, do the instrument and the software meet any data uh, integrity expectations uh, within your company? Uh, I think a uh, good aspect uh, you should uh, be aware of or, or you should uh, assess is uh, whether the system is, is able uh, to, to use the barcodes which are already used in your company. So this would simplify the, the tr uh, traceability of, of samples and, and, and all those kind of, of, of IT stuff uh, dramatically. The next step is uh, probably the, the most important part. This is the validation part. Uh, we feel, and, and this is described in this slide, that the validation of, of new technologies should be performed by a yeah, center of excellent pilot or primary site. Of course, you can, can run the exercise uh, or you can share the workload between multiple sites, but then uh, each of the sites must purchase or, or lease a, a device. Uh, you must share the workload, then you must bring together uh, all the information. So we felt, at least for Roche, we, we did in the past, and then we did it with the automated uh, colony counter as well. We used this pilot or primary site uh, concept. When we are talking about validation, I think it's crystal clear that uh, you have to keep uh, the, the existing guidance document uh, in your mind. So uh, EP 516, Alternative Micro Methods, USP 1223, PDA Tech Report 33. Uh, before you start the exercise, very important, uh, you must define the equipment qualification and the validation strategy. You must design the experiments, the statistical mod models must be, be must be defined. So you should have some discussions with, with uh, in-house uh, biostatisticians, uh, with, with QA and, and other uh, uh, departments in your company. Uh, when you have your qualification and validation strategy in your pockets, this could be a good time to approach uh, regulatory authorities. Uh, you could share your thoughts with them, and then yeah, sometimes it's it's really good to get feedback from the agencies uh, to avoid uh, any surprises uh, when you submit uh, without consulting the re regulatory uh, authorities upfront. So. We felt that for automated uh, colony uh, counter, uh, a modular concept for equipment qualification and method qualification can be applied. Uh, please aware that I am not using uh, the terminology method validation. I will explain in the next slide. We called it method qualification. Uh, but before I, I uh, guide you through our yeah, strategy and, and our uh, method qualification efforts, uh, I like to discuss some aspects with you. Uh, let's start with a, a time to result study. As I mentioned, one of these two devices allows to reduce the incubation time. Then, of course, you must define or determine the time to result. Uh, in the pharmacopoeias uh, for the microbial enumeration test uh, for product testing, 
product release testing, uh, there is uh, described that you should incubate uh, your plates, uh, membrane filtration plates for three to five days. Uh, whenever you, you intend to reduce your incubation time, you must define what is the appropriate time. So you need some comparability study uh, to define the right uh, time to result. This means what's the, the incubation time you need to generate valid results. Uh, in the next step, as I, I explained, uh, we, we use and I will describe a, a modular concept. Of course, this modular concept uh, is, is based on the classical equipment qualification steps, uh, IQ, OQ, PQ. Uh, for automated colony counter, we thought, and I will explain it to you why, we thought a special focus should be on accuracy and precision. And then we, after the qualification of the equipment, we perform so-called method qualification. So uh, we use three applications or we use the automated colony counters for three applications for product testing, for water testing and for EM testing. And each of these three applications have different method qualification requirements. As I mentioned here, are the details in the next four or five slides. So first of all, I think this is the most important piece and uh, we've had some discussions with, with uh, regulatory bodies. But first of all, if you introduce a new technology, uh, you must answer the question, is this an al alternative method or not? Alternative to the compendial method or not? You can find some statements uh, in, in uh, the pharmacopoeias and PDA tech report, uh, which will provide some guidance to you. Uh, what you can find here is a statement uh, you, you could find in uh, chapter 516 of the European Pharmacopoeia in the previous version, so in the version which was published in, in January 2008. Validation of this application would therefore require require validation of the recovery system employed rather than the entire test. In USP 1223, you can find a statement in the implementation of these enhanced methods for the detection of colony growth, very specific here, detection of colony growth. Only the detection capability of the method requires verification. And more or less, uh, this is the same philosophy you can find in PDA's tech report number 33. Some alternative or rapid technologies may be considered as automated traditional or compendial micro methods. And a risk assessment should be performed to determine the required testing that would support the validation of the alternative or rapid technology. In this context, what you can see here, right hand side, this is the well known uh, table with the acceptance criteria you have, or with the criteria you have to assess for an alternative micro method. Uh, you can see all the classical parameters, but we felt the essay itself uh, is more or less what is described in the pharmacopoeia. In the next slide, I, I will uh, dig a bit deeper. Uh, but we focused on accuracy and precision of the counting method. Of course, you need some robustness assessments, uh, different media lots, uh, different analysts, uh, different uh, essay dates. Uh, very important when you introduce a new technology, a new, new, new product, you must perform the classical method suitability test. Uh, so yeah, this uh, uh, needs to be done for automated colony counter as well. And highlighted is also equivalency testing, but equivalency testing uh, was performed only for the parameters accuracy and precision. Why? You can see here. First of all, probably all of you know the different uh, technologies and the readout methods. So very important, the first step is the compendial membrane filtration. So we use the same volumes, we use the same pore, di uh, pore diameter, uh, the same rinsing solutions, the, the same rinsing steps, three times 100 milliliter, whatever. Everything is really according to the compendia. And, and then we move, of course, we, we transfer the membranes uh, to the surface of, of agar. And then we move either these agar plates into these automated colony counting devices or in a classical incubator in, in our labs. Here starts the difference. So uh, the 
one system uh, takes pictures every uh, 30 minutes and it generates a final count after three to five days. In this case here, and this is why I uh, use this uh, device here, uh, every four hours a picture will be generated and we determined a time to result for product samples of 36 hours. This means after 36 hours, we will get the final result. Auto-generated result, which uh, will be transferred to our limb system uh, using a bidirectional interface and any uh, excursions uh, will be immediately marked. Uh, in the classical way, you have to wait three to five days, then you take out the plates and you can count uh, the, 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 uh, yeah, the colonies. Important, uh, we use the same media as I already mentioned. So this means we use TSA for product testing. Uh, we use R2A for, for water testing. We use TSA with inactivators for the EM testing. This is why where we claimed and, and we defended it against the agencies and reviewers. This is the compendial method just with a different readout, naked eye versus a CCD camera. And this allows us to reduce the incubation time but it's not an alternative method. And as I mentioned, uh, we, we uh, discussed with uh, some of, of the leading health authorities. Uh, there was an opportunity to discuss this with FDA, uh, yeah, more or less four years ago. Uh, the outcome is, is highlighted in yellow. FDA's feedback was crystal clear. There is no need to include change of manual to automated uh, counting uh, in the BLA. This is not a method change. On the other hand, this means there is no need to, to perform a full-blown method validation with all ICH pharmacopoeial uh, parameters. Cut the long story short, and then to summarize what, what I explained to you. So from our point of view, counting of colonies uh, uh, using an uh, automated colony counter is not an alternative method which requires a full-blown primary method validation according to EP516 or USP1223. Of course, we have to uh, complete and pass our equipment qualification, IQ, OQ, PQ. Uh, of course, in, in this case where you uh, use the device uh, which allows you to reduce the incubation time, then you must run a time to result study and a time to result equivalence. Uh, time to result after, in this case, uh, 36 hours for product testing versus three to five days for the uh, classical counting. And as I explained to you, uh, we compared the uh, automated colony counting and the traditional counting, uh, and then we focused on accuracy and, and precision, and we did an equivalency study. Uh, of course, uh, just a, a remark when you talk uh, to European health authorities, uh, the terminology is equivalency. Uh, US uh, FDA uses non-inferiority testing, but it's, it means the same. So what you can see here is more or less the, the modular concept I, I uh, talked about. Backbone is IQ, OQ, PQ, and then we have three applications. Uh, one is water testing, the, the second is EM testing, third is product testing. And in, uh, in the case uh, where you reduce the incubation time, then you need a layer in between. You must perform this TTR study for water samples, another TTR study for EM samples, and a third study uh, TTR study for product samples. And then, of course, you have to perform the method qualification uh, module. This means uh, accuracy and precision evaluation for classical testing versus automated colonic counting. Uh, one slide uh, regarding this TTR. Uh, this is uh, what we did to define uh, the time to result. So more or less we generated, I don't know how many classical growth curves, as you can see here in, in this picture. Uh, T0 means this is the time point when uh, we inoculated uh, the, the organisms. Uh, and then uh, after TP1 means after four hours, TP2 after eight, TP3 12 hours and so on. Uh, the, the pictures will be generated for the device we are using. Uh, we retrieve the, uh, the pictures, we, we, we check how many colonies uh, were counted by the machine 
and then we, we generated uh, a, a classical growth curve. Uh, what you can see, for example, let's focus on yeah, just this dark blue uh, growth curve. You can see an organism which requires 12 hours, which ha or which has a lag phase of 12 hours. So you see T0, 4 hours, 8 hours, 12 hours, no colonies uh, were detected. After eight hours, the growth of the organism starts. And uh, in this case, the final count, the stationary phase, so to speak, was available after 20 hours. Other organisms, for example, this light blue uh, curve here, uh, you can see there was a lag phase of more or less uh, eight hours. Then the growth starts slowly. It, uh, the organisms or the count enters into the exponential uh, growth phase. And finally, there is a, st a station, uh, stationary final count after 36 hours. This is how we determined the time to result. And for all the other exercises, which I will share with you in the next uh, three slides, we used uh, an incubation time of 36 hours. Okay, this is the accuracy and, and precision exercise. Uh, so we compared automated colony uh, counting with the reference method. This means the visual counting. We used seven uh, different organisms. We spiked at a level of uh, approximately 60 to 70 CFU per membrane. Of course, we used uh, the pharmacopoeial reference strains, well-known five organisms, and we included two in-house isolates, uh, yes, slow-growing organisms. Uh, each of, of these uh, seven organisms uh, were assessed in five independent analytical runs using different analysts, different lots of media uh, to, to, yeah, have an, uh, to, to generate a robustness uh, statement. And for each of, of the, the organisms and, and each of, of the independent analytical runs, we assessed six replicates per run. And these six replicates resulted in 12 dependent or paired uh, sample or the, uh, paired counts. So uh, I like to explain what is meant with paired. So in run one, for example, for, I don't know, Pseudomonas aeruginosa, we generated a solution with 60 to 70 CFU, and then we performed one membrane filtration, a second membrane filtration, third, fourth, fifth, and sixth. And finally, we get two results of each of these membrane filtrations. These uh, two counts are marked here and here. And these are the so-called paired samples. What does it mean? Uh, to explain this, I have to go back to, to this uh, description here. So what we did, we spiked one membrane with 70 to uh, 60 to 70 uh, organisms, incubated in uh, the automated colony counter. After 36 hours, we generated the final count for automated colony counting. And then we moved the plate from the automated colony counting device into compendia in, into uh, traditional incubators, which are located in our labs. Uh, we expanded uh, the incubation, and after three days in some of incubation, two analysts counted uh, the colonies on the plate. And after additional two days of incubation, after five days, uh, we recounted the result. And these are the paired samples. This means this number here and this number in, in the second part of this table, this was generated using the same membrane filtration step, the same spike uh, activity, the same plate. So from on a, uh, in a statistical point of view, this is really a paired sample. Uh, we evaluated that we need uh, in, in some 30 uh, counts for automated colony counting and then 30 counts for the reference method to have a, a stati uh, sufficient statistical power, a minimum power of eight. And using these 30 uh, yeah, counts uh, for, for each of the organisms, uh, we did the uh, accuracy and precision assessment. So I don't like to guide you through this uh, statistical hypothesis and, and whatever. I'm not a biostatistician. Let's focus on the acceptance criteria. For accuracy, uh, 
our non-inferiority or equivalency claim is accepted if the lower bound, very important, of the one-sided 95% confidence interval for the difference of means is, is larger than minus 0.1625. And for the precision uh, parameter, the non-inferiority is accepted if the upper bound, in this case, of the one-sided 95% confidence interval for the variant compound tonal is less than 0.7 multiplied with 0.7 or uh, less than 0.49. These are our acceptance criteria. And uh, yeah, all our seven organisms for, for all accounts uh, uh, fulfilled these accept, uh, acceptance criteria. This means using 36 hours of incubation, using the automated colony counting, we are at least as good as the compendial method or the, the, the classical uh, counting uh, by analysts. Uh, I already mentioned a very important part and, and this is an, an activity you have to perform for, for any kind of alternative or rapid methods is the me method suitability test. So whenever you introduce a new matrix, a new sample, then you have to go, uh, you have to run this method suitability test. Here one example, this is a monoclonal antibody process, uh, and th this is the, the truck substance level. Uh, we use three different PPQ batches. Uh, and then we performed this method suitability test, uh, which was performed in accordance with, with EP2612 or USP61. No difference between the classical counting method or the automated colony counter. Of course, uh, we, we did not uh, use only the five uh, reference organisms, but we included two additional, the two in-house strains. And it was the same exercise, which is uh, very well known. So we determine uh, the recovery of the spiked organisms in the presence of the product and in the absence of the product. As you can see here, uh, this is the, the, the count uh, for, for the automated colony counter. Without product, uh, we have uh, 23 uh, organisms uh, or colonies. After, uh, in the presence of the product, we have uh, 37. Uh, 27, sorry, and we have the same numbers uh, for the traditional counting. If you calculate the recovery, the recovery rate is 117%. Acceptance criteria, well known, 50 to 200%. No inhibitory components uh, or substance in our sample. Uh, yeah, we did uh, this uh, three times with the, the drug substance sample, and uh, we, we did this exercise for all the IPC steps as well. And of course, as I uh, already mentioned, whenever you introduce a new product or a new manufacturing process, you have to uh, do this method suitability test. Uh, a short introduction in, into the modular concept for, for water samples and for EM samples, we, we follow the, the same philosophy. So first of all, we determine the TTR, the time to result for water samples uh, and then for EM samples. Uh, let's start with water samples. Uh, we defined or determined a TTR of 108 hours. Uh, for your information, GSK 100 hours, so it's very similar. Of course, we used uh, the R2A uh, agar cassettes, and uh, we, we means Roche, we used three different organisms. Uh, we generated the growth curves for, for these three organisms. Uh, Bacillus subtilis is one of the positive controls mentioned in the European pharmacopoeia and the water monographs. And then we included uh, two slow-growing in-house isolates, Undibacterium oligocarbophilum, uh, and an organism which was, even with, with sequencing, was not able to identify down to a species level. So Afpia, Rhodopsoidomonas, Rhizobium uh, species. Uh, no surprise, these two organisms are really slow-growing organisms compared to, to Bacillus subtilis. Uh, this triggered the 100 hours TTR for water samples. We did the same accuracy and intermediate precision exercise with the three organisms I presented to you. Uh, we generated 30 counts uh, for, for each of the organisms with, with both technologies and we fulfilled uh, the acceptance criteria. For EM samples, a similar approach. Uh, we defined uh, 52 hours as uh, TTR. Uh, GSK uh, a bit higher, 72 hours. We used uh, TSA agar with, with inactivators. Uh, for this exercise, for the TTR, we used 15 different uh, naturally contaminated cassettes. This means contacts 
from our surfaces, uh, yeah, lab bench, uh, floor, whatever. Uh, then we incubated, uh, uh, we generated the growth curves, uh, we, we determined uh, the 52 hours. Uh, in addition, uh, we, we included the seven reference organisms. Uh, this was a discussion we have, we've had uh, yeah, a decade ago with uh, FDA uh, inspectors uh, that growth promotion tests uh, for, for EM plates should include uh, the classical in-house, uh, uh, the classical pharmacopoeial strains. Uh, no surprise, uh, the five uh, reference organisms and, and the two in-house isolates uh, resulted in a TTR of 28 hours, but the naturally uh, contaminations uh, yeah, required 52 hours. Uh, yeah, uh, we, we repeated uh, this uh, non-inferiority study, accuracy and in precision, uh, and it passed the acceptance criteria. So these are... Uh, more or less the same exercise uh, I described to you uh, for water and EM samples. The eighth step is the global deployment. Uh, of course, if you decide to, to use this uh, center of excellent pilot site concept, then you have to transfer the technology in, into your network. Uh, the secondary sites should follow the same testing protocol. Uh, of course, you need a transfer protocol. You must define uh, acceptance criteria for the transfer. Uh, yeah, well-known activities, very important site-specific such as in-house isolates must be considered. Uh, we felt, and maybe this is a last comment regarding the center of excellence and pilot concept, we, we felt that it would be good to run or to use this uh, concept uh, as uh, resource constraints may be, limited, uh, may be limit the implementation at several times at once. Uh, very important, uh, subsequent sites can take advantage of the strategy and then the documents, the pilot site generated, so equipment qualification, protocols, data integrity assessments, uh, uh, IQ, OQ, PQ protocols, and in best case, MQ reports as well. Uh, so a lot of, of uh, lessons learned uh, could be uh, generated at the pilot site and then could be tran transferred to the secondary recipient sites. Very important, uh, highlighted here, this concept of, of method transfer and, and uh, leveraging any documents is only valid if all testing parameters are identical. Only under these circumstances, the, the experiments uh, performed at the primary site using the compendial microorganisms can be used for the secondary sites as well. But very important, uh, the secondary or the receiving sites must consider and, and must run some experiments with in-house organisms as well. But of course, it's it's much less work compared uh, to to what what has been done at the primary site. Last but not least, step nine is the regulatory filing and implementation status. Yeah, to cut the long story short, uh, there is no golden path forward, so to speak. So you, you can introduce a new technology at, at various stages uh, during the, the product life cycle. You can file it in uh, the development phase of a new product. This means uh, it should be included in the clinical trial application. You can file it as part of the launch, commercial launch of a new product. Or even after the launch, uh, when when you talk or when we talk about uh, already uh, approved commercially marketed products, you can uh, introduce a new technology via analytical changes, so-called post-approval changes. So you must decide on your own with your uh, uh, rec affair department what is the, the the best way to introduce the technology. And uh, a second very important aspect is. Uh, you must consider uh, country-specific requirements. One important aspect, and this is what we learned during our filing process, we introduced the technology uh, during, uh, as is part of a post-approval change process. Uh, there was one country, China, which did not accept our strategy that this is not an alternative method. Uh, they felt the readout triggers uh, that this is an alternative microbiological method. Uh, so more or less, I had to, to rewrite uh, the dossier or the chapters. And for all the other countries, uh, I didn't use the terminology alternative rapid method. 
Uh, and, and I talked about method qualification activities. Uh, for, for China, I introduced alternative micro method as a terminology and I talked about method qualification. At the end of the day, we could sell the same results and the same exercises we did. This means accuracy, precision evaluation and equivalency statement uh, equivalent, uh, with respect to accuracy and precision comparing classical counting versus the uh, automated colony counter. Uh, there is another uh, very important aspect. Uh, it, it depends which market you supply with your product. Some countries require in-country testing. This means uh, you must transfer the method, the technology to specific uh, labs in this respective country. And either this is sufficient so that in theory uh, a lab is able to perform or to repeat the release test. Uh, other countries, uh, only a handful, uh, South Korea is a, is a typical country, they will repeat the, the testing with the new technology. Uh, yeah, but these are only very rare cases where you have to transfer the technology uh, to, to any specific uh, labs uh, in the respective country. And then there are yeah, very little specific requirements. Uh, Switzerland, this is just one example, they have a specific uh, procedure uh, for alternative micro methods. When you introduce an alternative microbiological method, you must inform the Swiss Matic upfront. Don't ask me why, if you would introduce a new analytical chemistry method, there is no need to inform Swiss Matic upfront, but for alternative micro methods, this is a requirement for Switzerland. So yeah, to cut a long story short, you, you must uh, contact your, your rec affair department uh, and it, uh, of course, they must know their landscape and it would be good to uh, approach the uh, rec affair, uh, the, the health authority upfront to discuss these specifics or little details upfront. Last but not least, this is my last slide. Uh, what is the filing and approval status? We can share the situation at Roche and at GSK. Let's start with Roche. Uh, yeah, we both uh, used uh, the pilot side uh, application or strategy. Uh, Roche did uh, one side at, at Roche did all the exercises for water testing, for product testing, and for EM testing. We introduced uh, the automated colony counter, counting for water samples in October 2019. Uh, we did uh, the exercise in, in 2019 uh, for, a, for product testing and we submitted a pilot submission for a recombinant uh, biopharmaceutical. It was a recombinant protein, not the monoclonal antibody, but okay, this is irrelevant. We submitted it in January 2020 to I don't know how many health authorities. And after approval of the system by numerous health authorities, uh, we, we started uh, the routine testing for this specific product. And this was in October 2020. From that time point on, uh, we use any filing opportunity, either clinical trial applications or launch activities, uh, but also uh, post approval changes, control lifecycle updates or whatever to introduce uh, the, the automated colony counter. Uh, this site in, in, in Germany did the, all the validation or qualification uh, activities for EM samples and I, they introduced uh, the automated colony counting for EM samples in June 21, a year ago. Right now, the technology is being rolled out to eight other sites uh, in the Global Roche Network. Uh, focus is on, on product testing and let's keep our fingers crossed. We can uh, complete the exercise by the end of, of 20. Two. Uh, next step would be to uh, use the, the system for water testing and then yeah, all the activities will start in early 23. What's the situation at GSK? GSK uh, has uh, uh, or two sites uh, have a validated system uh, on their campus. Uh, one side has fully implemented the system for water and EM testing. The second side is close to implementation. Uh, they work on the integration of the system into their limbs uh, and in parallel a feasibility study uh, is, is underway uh, at one side for product testing. Uh, and with this slide, I think it's time, oh, there are only a handful of minutes for any questions. <laughs>